Hello, my name is Andre Ward and I'm the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Portrait Society. Welcome to Both Sides of the Barbs, a discussion-driven show that examines the legal system from various perspectives, including people most impacted by the criminal legal system. We discuss critical issues um, about criminal legal reform and raise questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone that is impacted by it. We ask you, the listener and the viewer, to spread the word about both sides of the bars. You can share your comments on Twitter at the Fortune Society SOC. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about Pell Grant's rest restoration. And when we think about that, you know, significance as it affected, affects so many people. Recently, Congress presented stimulus package that included significant changes to higher education, including the restoration of federal finances, financial aid for people that are in prison. And in 1994, as it currently existed, following that year, it was banned. And the restoration of Pell Grants now for incarcerated people means so much and really represents a watershed moment for those who are involved in the criminal legal reform world. Today, I have the good fortune of having someone who is not only just impacted by Pell Grants in the way that they have obviously grown and developed, but also is representing those issues here today. I have none other than Daiwan Tatro. And Daiwan, obviously, you know, he joins us as the Governor, government affairs officer at the Bard Prison Initiative. As a Bar Prison Initiative alumnus, he really leverages his education and experience to shift public policy in favor of expanding college and prisons. Daiwan, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? And welcome to both sides of the bars. Thank you, Andre, for having me. And I'd also like to highlight for everyone, I also happen to be um, a board member of the Fortune Society, which is truly an honor. Absolutely. And we thank you for your work that you do um, at, at the Fortune Society as a board member, and thank you again for joining the show. I really want to get right into it. You know, Daiwan, we've been having this conversation over the last few weeks or so, and obviously you are truly passionate about this work, have been featured in a really, really powerful and amazing documentary to highlight the importance of education. Talk to us, give us a little historical context about Pell and federal aid to folk who are incarcerated. Yeah, so a lot of people don't understand or know the history here. So prior to 1994, for about two generations, um, college and prison had been standard practice, um, a fundamental to what we term rehabilitation um, in the Amer within the American prison system. So the 1994 crime bill, um, the democratic tough on crime moment, moment made incarcerated individuals ineligible for federal Pell Grants. And so what we see nationally is that the number of college and prison programs fell from over 700 to less than 10, pretty much overnight. And Congress did this despite the fact that if someone got an education in prison, they were the least likeliest not only to ever go back to prison, but also had the most successful life um, outcomes post-release. And so it was Pell was eliminated, you know, in the face of an overwhelming body, body of evidence that pointed to its efficacy. Yeah, and so when we're talking about that, and I know that, you know, when we're talking about the efficacy of education and the real um, positive outcomes of higher education, it just made sense, right, to keep that in existence. But, you know, in the state, right, you had, Democrats and Republicans alike at the time, in many instances, particularly those from upstate, um, that were elevating and lifting up this idea that people that are incarcerated are getting higher education at the cost of taxpayers, right? And taking away from their own children in, in those instances, right? Getting access to college. So talk about like, when you, you, when you think about that, right? These outcomes, right? You say it went from 700 prisons throughout New York State, New York, I mean, throughout the country, nationally. rather, receiving that nationally till 10, right? Talk about, like, how much sense does that make to do something like that? And talk a little bit more about the outcome piece. Um, 
the Pell ban didn't make sense at any level. You know, on the human level, if we're going to send people back to prison to rehabilitate them, but strip them from having any meaningful programs that allows them to effectively transition back into society to find gainful employment, that doesn't make sense. In terms of economics, you know, the Rand Corporation just found in 2016 that for every um, dollar a state spends on college and prison programming, it saves four to five dollars in reincarceration costs. And so, hell, can you repeat that again? Can you repeat that again? For can you repeat that again, Taiwan? It's just state spends, invests in college and prison, it saves four to five in reincarceration costs. And so, educating people, educating people in prison actually saves money. It doesn't cost money. But in terms of, you know, someone in prison taking kind of like um, college dollars away from someone else, Pell is an entitlement program, right? And so there is no, this is not a zero sum game. This is not somebody in prison gets a Pell grant and somebody else does it, right? There's enough money within that program um, to fund tons and tons of education in this country. It's interesting to note that because most people think otherwise, right? So that data and that reference that you've just given makes perfect sense. And so now we're talking about obviously like like where we are now, right? We find ourselves in a position um, to some degree where you know there has been the restitute, the restoration, I would say, um, or restoring of of Pell. And and what does that mean, right? And what would the what what we'd have to go through to get that? So, you know, this has been an amazing fight by, you know, um, different activists and advocates for 26 years. Um, people like Vivian Nixon at the College and Community Fellowship, my executive director, Max Kennedy, um at the Bar Prison Initiative, you know, the Vera Institute of Justice and college and prison programs all over this country, you know, have really, really worked for this moment. And it took a bipartisan group in Congress to come together and get this through. And of all people, you know, Donald Trump to sign this in law. I don't think any of us foresaw that it was going to happen at this moment, um, but it did. Right. And what it means is that between Pell restoration means in terms of kind of numbers and what that's going to do to college and prison landscape nationally um, is that we're going to see tens and tens of thousands of incarcerated individuals enrolled in college, you know, over the next five years, right? It doesn't go into effect until 2024. Um, so that's gonna give some time for the DOE to change the FASA, um, to get programs um, up and running and applied to draw down Pell. There's some, some protections built into the bell to disqualify kind of predatory institutions um, in the college and prison space. And, but what we're going to see is a dramatic increase in the number of individuals enrolled in, a, in what that means in terms of society on the grounds that we're sending people back to their communities who are ready to step into the workplace, who are ready to pay taxes, who are ready to go back in their communities like our um, alumni overwhelming at BPI and change the forces and factors on the ground that led to their incarceration in the first place. So we should never underestimate the value of incarceration and what it means to have individuals with both an education and the experience to affect real change. Speaking of which, right, folk, obviously, they get educated through the Pell Grant, right? At least that's one part of it. And we'll talk about the other part that's a, cre a critical piece to um, getting access to higher education in prison. But for example, people who went through the higher education programs, they come out tax paying people, right? They become an asset rather than a liability to the community and they live a life of contribution. You seem, obviously, Daiwan, you have a story to tell, right? And for our listening or for our viewers, right? Talk to us about your own trajectory, right? Your own educational odyssey and what did that yield relative to debates and other doors that have been opened to you because you were a beneficiary off of higher education in prison. Talk to our list of viewers about that. Yeah, you know, I think a great place to start is, you know, someone once asked a, a colleague of mine, you know, whether or not they deserve an education in prison. He said, for me, that's not the question. The question is what I'm going to do with it, right? And so I'm someone who just spent 12 years in prison, um, was got into the Bard Prison Initiative in 2013, um, mm -hmm. spent five years incarcerated, working on a degree, got out, um, finished my senior project um, at Bard, graduated in 2018, 
um, and have done a number of different things before assuming my current role at BPI, where I work to, um, I've worked on Pell restoration at the federal level, but more work doing work primarily here in New York State and in New York City to build reentry supports for our alumni coming out of prison and to really um, protect the college and prison landscape in New York, which is one of the best in the country um, to preserve that as we um, move towards full Pell restoration, right? Um, but what it means to have an education or to leave prison with an education, right? Just irrespective of the degree. Um, I have an older brother who's been to prison. I have a younger brother who's been to prison. And the types of opportunities that have been allotted to them coming out of prison without having an education or a degree um, stand in really, really contrast to the types of things that I have been able to do. And so when we talk about the value of it to the individual, you know, both of my brothers have young children, them not being able to find meaningful, gainful, long-term employment to build careers, um, that's gonna have an impact on the way that they're able to care for their families, right? Yeah. And so we can't only think of the value of education in prison at the level of the individual, of the incarcerated um, individual, right? This is something that radiates outwards, right? This has an impact on societies. It has an impact on communities. It has an impact on families. Sure. And, you know, again, speaking, Daiwan, about your own educational odyssey um, while inside, right, you were featured in a documentary. Right. In addition to that, you know, this documentary, I mean, I saw it, I was, I was blown away, not because you're the exception. Right, Daiwan, although you're powerful, you're a leader, and we have tremendous respect for you. And there are no exceptions necessarily for those of us who are leaders or formerly incarcerated. But just the experience alone. Right. And that documentary demonstrated excellence. Right. And what human beings who are incarcerated have the opportunity to become. What's given, put in the right space and given the opportunity. Talk a little bit about your experience with the debate that did occur with you. In the yeah, absolutely, Andre. But, you know, I, I want to spend the moment on that idea of exceptionalism, you know, because mm -hmm. it's something that um, me and I think all BPI alumni run up against. And what I like to tell people is that, you know, I'm not an exceptional per person. I had an exceptional opportunity. Right. And that opportunity um, made all of the difference. And so the value of an education, as I keep saying, is something that is really, really highlighted um, in College Behind Bars, which is a four part, four hour documentary executive produced by Ken Burns, directed by Lynn Novick. Um, it was released in November of 2019. And we've spent the last 18 months to two years all over the country um, on a social impact campaign around um, the film. You know, we did several screenings on Capitol Hill in support of Pell Restoration. And as you say, Andre, the film is really, really super powerful. And one of the most powerful elements for me is that unlike other Lenovic films where there's a narrator, there's no narrator in this film, right? It's incarcerated people speaking for themselves, representing themselves. And what that does is that that really overturns and pushes back against the negative stereotypes and caricatures that we usually see willed out to um, suppress ideas of what incarcerated people are capable of and who they are. You know, one of the things we like to say at the Bar Prison Initiative is that we're in the business um, of education and part of that business defying expectations of who education is for and where it might lead. Absolutely. And you all were featured debating those folks from Harvard, right? And, you know, I know obviously you're, you're humble. So, you know, you're humble, Daiwan. So you don't really lift it up. But it's a big deal, right? That you all were inside, right? You were involved in this educational experience. You and other men were incarcerated and took on a challenge of engaging folk from the Harvard debate team. And what happened? Yeah, so it's really, really amazing moment. Um, it's featured in the film and it's been covered sort of extensively by the um, Wall Street Journal. And so in 2015, I was on a team with um, some colleagues of mine at, um, at BPI um, and we took on a team from Harvard University in a debate um, and we won. I, I think the story was like the t one of the top five, you know, stories searched on Google in that year and went viral and was just picked up by the AP and just all over and throughout the world. And again, you know, what I think, you know, part of what we learned from that story is how many people in the world dislike Harvard. But 
also, you know, people's interest in the story was founded in the fact that it really challenged how they thought about incarcerated people, right? It's like, wow, these people in prison can beat Harvard. What else are they capable of? And we've been able to leverage that moment to have an ongoing dialogue and conversation, you know, for the past five years that really, again, challenges common um, denigrative narratives of who incarcerated people are and what they're capable of. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of challenges, right, we've obviously overcome one hurdle, right? We have Pell Restoration now on the horizon. That's about to settle and we're going to move along in that. But then there's a very another important piece, right, to higher education in prisons, and that's TAP, right? Tuition Assistance Program. Now talk a little bit about that for our viewers. Like what is TAP? Um, and and how does that play into making sure that the full support of the educational programs in prisons um, exists. Yeah, so again, to dig into the history here, what happened in 1994 when the federal government um, made incarcerated people ineligible for um, financial aid, which are Pell Grants at the federal level, states all across this country followed suit, right, and made incarcerated people ineligible for state level, state-based financial aid. So in 1994, the Pell ban was enacted at the federal level. In 1995, New York State enacted a TAP program. And so TAP, or the Tuition Assistance Program, is in a nutshell, state level financial aid. And so what we saw in New York in particular over that two year period is the number of college and prison programs fall from over 70 to four, right? And so, in 1999, um, Bard College, Max Kenner started the um, Bard Prison Initiative in, you know, totally privately funded and for the past 20 years and overwhelmingly privately funded and has really done a lot um, to exemplify the value of college and prison, right? We know in New York intimately um, that college and prison is effective. Right. Not only in lowering recidivism, because that's a very, very low bar, but also, you know, we have I have peers, I have colleagues who have walked out of prison after 5, 10, 15, 20 years into Ph.D. programs at Yale, at Cornell, who have master's degrees from Columbia, who are all over New York City um, and beyond doing really, really amazing work. And so if we want the college and prison landscape in America, in New York State particularly to expand in a real and robust way. And I don't think there's anyone who doesn't at this point. You know, back in 2004, the governor um, tried to do a statewide college and prison program and got a lot of pushback. But one of the things that came out of that moment, you know, it was a failed moment. One thing that came out of that moment was public polling, right? And over 60% of New Yorkers, and this is 2014, were on the side of expanding college and prison, right? And so that number has only risen since then. And so what we need at this point, hell is a lifeline to college and prison programs, right? We also need TAP to come back because it has always taken a combination of Pell, TAP, foundation money, um, and private support to make college and prison work in a real robust way. And, you know, I was thinking too, right? I was listening to the governor's budget address today and, you know, when you're talking about the reinstitution of, of TAP, right, there was no mention of, of, of obviously the criminal justice reform platform at all in his address. But I wonder, right, uh, Daiwan, as we're thinking about um, New York State funding, right, for higher education, particularly around TAP, how difficult will that be, right? We're in right now where the country is in a state of budget austerity. Um, what, what are some of the things that folk can do to support that? Yeah, one of the great things about something like TAP um, restoration, or we like to say a turn on the TAP here in New York, is that college and prison is ultimately a cost-saving um, mechanism, right? And so this is not going to cost the state money. It is going to save money. But in terms of real dollars that have to go into the program, you know, the state spends anywhere from 800 to $900 million a year on tuition assistance, right? Um right on. In terms of, you know, tap to incarcerated individuals, we are talking about a fraction of that, 
you know, if we look at the years from 2016 to 2019, if TAP had been, um, if TAP had been active during that time, it would have cost the state on average less than 0.5% a year. So less than 0.5% of the total TAP expenditure would have been going to incarcerated individuals. And also, Andre, something important to note um, is that I don't think we can ever have these conversations where we're talking about um, Pell restoration, TAP restoration, college and prison. We're having coded conversations about race, right? And what we've seen historically in this country um, is mechanism and mecha after mechanisms that have been used to lock primor primarily minorities out of educational opportunity. Let's recall here in New York City that you know, CUNY was free until black people showed up on campus, right? Then they started um, charging. And so it's no happenstance that when we have a prison population here in New York State um, that is 80% black and Latino, it is acceptable to make them ineligible for um, financial aid for higher education, right? This is just as much a race issue as it is an education issue, as it is an economic issue. But again, and it, you know, just really, really want to drive this point home that this is something that makes total sense. It's going to cost money. It's going to save money. It's going to better lives. And it is bipartisanly popular. If Donald Trump is president, can sign Pell restoration in, into law, I think that's something even under the current budget circumstances that Andrew Cuomo can easily do. And it's a really good point, right? The intersectionality between race and access to higher education, which you said is often not discussed, but it inextricably linked, right, to everything else, right? Because if we're talking about institutional racism, right, institutional racism impacts every facet of black and brown folks' lives, whether it be accessing a, a loan for a home, higher education, medical, uh, your medical uh, supports, like all those things are like compromised, right? And, and overwhelmingly um, like challenge, right, when you are experiencing racism. So that's a very good point. So, I mean, we have a few more minutes remaining, uh, Daiwan, and I'm just thinking like, so what are some things that folk can do, right, to get involved in this campaign? I know that you referenced yeah. earlier, um, uh, release the tap, right, or, or, turn, or on. turn on the tap, right, like tap water, which is a thing really catchy and powerful. What are some of the things people can do to support? So, you know, amazingly, um, Senator Velmanette Montgomery um, just retired this year um, in four a very long time. She helped legislation in the Senate um, to restore TAP. Her counterpart, um, Assemblyman um, in the Assembly, um, is Assemblyman Aubrey. Um, and I think it would be a fitting way to honor her memory by passing TAP restoration this year. And so, what you can do, um, you can reach out to your local um, elected officials, your Assemblyman, your, your state senator, and tell them to literally turn on the TAP, right? That you want to see um, TAP restored to incarcerated. Um, people. Um, us at the Bar Prison Initiative have teamed up with um, CCF, um, Community College Community Fellowship, College Community Fellowship mm -hmm. um, and we are going to be organized and running the um, Turn on the Tap a campaign this budget cycle. And we are really, really aiming to put the governor, put the legislature in a position where they can't say no. And, you know, just to I like something in regard to that, you know, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, this is going to be a fight with everyone. There is broadband support for this within the assembly, within the Senate. There's some really, really fine people who believe um, in the value of education in prison. And it's just about getting it done. You know, it's about really making this a priority in Albany. And the way we do that is, you know, everyone who watches this, everyone who hears about it, right, go online write to your senator, write to your assemblyman, tell them that we should be educating, offering higher education to people in prison and that we need to restore tap. Absolutely. And this is just not here in New York State. Um, as we know that both sides of the bars is shown on 20 and 26 states and 103 stations. This is a national um, issue. And thanks to Bard College and to Daiwan, and our folk from College and Community Fellowship, Vivian Nixon and others, who continue to full-throatedly like announce, right, the I, I demand, the need to restore TAP. Um, so we still have some fighting to do, right? To some, there's still some challenges, um, but I'm confident 
Daiwan, that you and other leaders who are advancing um, this campaign to restore TAP will be successful. It's just a matter of time. So how can people on this view in this show get in contact with Bar College Initiative? Um, so BPI, you can find us BPI. on social media, um, on the internet, but you can go to bpi.bar.edu and find any information, any information you need to contact us. Um, I'm on Twitter at Daiwan Tetro. Um, and so if you need to reach out to me, you can do it there. I'm also on Instagram, daiwan.t. Um, you can follow me there. Um, my email is attached to both of my accounts. And so I'm someone you reach out to, contact, and going to be working on these issues here in New York and also engaging nationally. Daiwan Tetro, thank you so much for joining us, both sides of the bars. And for you, the listener and the viewer for this show, we always thank you for joining both sides of the bars. Stay tuned, and we'll see you next month. Be careful, be safe, and be well. If you want to know how to reduce crime in America, in New York City, you do it one person at a time, creating an environment that celebrates the human spirit. Recidivism is a result of societal failure to do that, and fortune has demonstrated that lives can change. I tell people all the time, this is where I grew up. This is where I learned what being a man is and what being a productive citizen means. It is the work of this great organization that has helped to shape my ideas, drive my conviction, and further deepen my commitment to the cause. For more than half a century, you have amplified the voices of those who are impacted by unfair policies and helped thousands of justice-involved people transform their lives. You have led by example to show how we can help formerly incarcerated individuals come home, rebuild their lives, and contribute to our communities. COVID-19 worsens existing barriers to re-entry. Re-entry is hard enough as is, but even harder during a pandemic. Fortune Society is at the forefront of hope and lasting positive change. 